All right, hey, we are in uh, the smack dab in the middle of the fall feasts. And, um, and again, I want to acknowledge the fact that many of us did not grow up having uh, any clue what that would mean. And, and that's completely understandable. And so if, if you're in the dark and don't understand, that's completely fine. Uh, my, my goal and my desire is, is to teach this and so that we're aware of it. Now, we grew up in typically in Christian churches that celebrated certain events on a yearly basis. <clears throat> What we try to do at New Hope is center and focus our year around the times when God says, I'd like you to acknowledge these events, okay? And if you look at in Leviticus chapter 23, God kind of lays them out in order, and he says, these are the things, the times of the year that I want you to acknowledge. So he calls them Moedim. We've got a whole series on Moedim and what, do Mo, what does Moedim mean and it's very significant. If you wanted to go back, check that out on YouTube. It's on there. Um, but the depth of these is astounding, okay? And, and uh, each year, I, uh, in the spring, and then there's, there's three in the spring, one in the summer, three in the fall, uh, I teach on them. I take time to teach on them because, A, uh, this is what God asks us to do, acknowledge the times, and there's so much depth and imagery to them it's impossible to capture that in a single message. And so for each one of them, I would have to do a series to try to, to grasp the depth of them. I'm not doing that this time. Today I'm just going to talk about uh, the Feast of Trumpets and uh, what does that mean and give a little bit of understanding. Uh, but understand I am only touching the, the tip of the iceberg here. Because there's so much. I was just reminded this morning, uh, Joe was sharing with me a, a song about it, and and it was, uh, and they mentioned that the books. This is the day the books are opened. That's a whole other part that I had even forgot to put in my notes today. But but it's uh, some some beautiful beautiful imagery. So what am I talking about? <clears throat> Leviticus chapter twenty three. When God meets with His people on Mount Sinai, <clears throat> understand that Mount Sinai. When God meets them there, he's marrying his people. It's a wedding ceremony. Okay, If you have in your mind that Mount Sinai is when God says, here's some laws, now follow these laws. Wipe that from your mind. Okay, What happens at Mount Sinai is God steps up and, and, and then his bride, the nation of Israel, they come forward and he takes them as his bride and he marries them. Okay, now what you and I look at as laws and commandments, and we think of as very judicial and condemning, those are God revealing himself to his people and making promises to them. This is the kind of God that I am. This is the kind of relationship that I want to have with you. And so you understand who I am and how we're going to relate in this relationship. <clears throat> The Ten Commandments, now we talk about commandments, we always think ten, there's actually 613. But those Ten Commandments, those are kind of like the wedding vows. Now we do the same thing in our churches, and, and when we get married, we make vows. We, we say things that if anybody else were to look at it, it would look like a commandment. You know, I promise to love you, to cherish you, in sickness and in health. We're, we're making statements of this is what I'm going to do. That's the same thing the Ten Commandments are. Okay. In fact, in the Jewish communities, uh, when they stand up and they read the Ten Commandments uh, during their service, many of them weep because they're reviewing the vows that they have with God, that their love relationship they have with God. So, all of that to say, uh, this is in Leviticus 23. This is one of these things where God says, here's times that I want to spend with you. And they list off seven of them. Okay, There's three in the fall, Passover. Uh, unleavened bread, first fruits, those bam, 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 right three together. Oftentimes they're referred to because they're all together as Passover. Then 50 days later, there's Pentecost. Uh, it's all in the Hebrew, it's called Shavuot. And it's uh, seven weeks later or 50 days later. And, and that's in the summertime. Now we find ourselves in the middle of the fall feast. It is, they are historically uh, important because of what happens in Scripture at these times. They are practically important because they are oftentimes centered around uh, a harvest. They're bringing in 
uh, wheat or barley or the fruits from their harvest. Uh, they are prophetically important because they tell us something about Jesus. And all of these things come together. So much imagery that are packed into these things, which is why it's so beautiful to, to understand and to see them. Now, inevitably, somebody wants to say, well, do we have to celebrate them? Do you have to? No. Uh, well, I mean, your salvation doesn't depend upon it. Okay, I guess we have to define what have to means. Uh, we get to. Do you want to know your Lord? Do you want to know Jesus better? Then yeah, we do this stuff. It's not because God is sitting up there waiting to smack us if we don't. But he's up there pleading, listen, I want time with you. That's why we do it. Because it's time with God to where we get to know him and know him better. Uh, so we're in this little series called Not Yet. And, and for a couple of reasons. Last week we talked about Isaiah 58. And Isaiah 58 kind of sets the tone and says, listen, uh, before you step into a celebration for God, you need to think, why are you doing this? And are you doing this in the right mindset? Are you doing this with the right heart? Because if you're coming into this thinking that, uh, God, I'm going to uh, celebrate this day. I'm going to say the right words. I'm going to do the right sacrifice. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to give my tithe to church. And then you have to whatever. Then you're in the wrong mindset. Especially if you're like, God, I have prayed to you. Please destroy my enemy. He specifically says that that's not what this is about. Okay, when we draw close to God in these times, this is a very loving and kind and nurturing time where we draw close to God. In these loving and nurturing times, what we do to display that is we go out and we have love and nurture and take care of those around us. Okay, so when God says, My fast, he talks about my fast. My fast isn't so that you can be angry, you can get hangry, right? You're hungry and you're angry and hangry, and so you start taking it out on people around you. No, he says, instead, that food that you so desperately want to eat, take it out to somebody who didn't have food yesterday and give it to them. Okay, so mindset. Now, we're talking about uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Um, what the Feast of Trumpets speaks of in the life of Jesus, in a nutshell, is his return. Okay, next week is uh, the Day of Atonement. It goes by on your calendars. You might see it as Yom Kippur. Yom simply means day. Kippur means atonement. And, and this signifies or, or, or gives us a glimpse of what the judgment day is going to be like. The day of atonement, the, uh, where forgiveness is given out or exile is given out. And then after that, about a week or so, is uh, the Feast of Sukkot, which means tabernacles or tents or temporary dwelling. And that is a time that pictures eternity with God. These are all things that while we can look at them and go, we believe this is what it signifies by everything that Scripture tells us, obviously it hasn't happened yet. Okay? Jesus hasn't returned yet. Okay? We haven't had Judgment Day yet. We are not yet living in the presence of God for eternity. Um. Again, because I will talk about uh, trumpets also goes by Rosh Hashanah. Because I talk about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, why are you so Jewish? This isn't Jewish, okay? This is biblical. This is the idea, this is what God is saying through the Bible. And we intend to show how it relates to Jesus. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, Jesus was Jewish. I, I, I'm assuming the laughter is because, duh. But that's not always the case. Many people, Jesus was not Jewish. He was Christian. He was not a Christian. Okay? He was Christ, but he was Jewish. He was a Jewish rabbi. All right. If there's uh, questions or concerns or comments about that, please come talk to me. Um, all right. So let's talk about Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is more commonly known as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means beginning, or head, Rosh is head, 
Ha is the Shana year, head of the year. Okay, it's the new year. It's the start of a new year. It's a new beginning. And so this is a, a, a New Year's celebration when we're talking about Rosh Hashanah. So uh, understand that that's connected to this day. Rosh Hashanah, celebration of a new year. All right, and we're going to give you several things to kind of hold on to and cling to as we're talking about this. This is not all of them. This is just a few of them. This is a time that's filled with hope. It's a time where you're, you're excited about uh, change, about the coming year. And that's another thing. You're excited about change when you're talking about Rosh Hashanah. Something is going to change. Where things are going to be different. Uh, it's, this is a new year. Oftentimes this is celebrated today in the Jewish communities by eating apples and honey. It's a very tangible way to say this is an, an expression of my prayers. I'm praying fruitfulness for the coming year and sweetness for the coming year. And so you eat apples and honey. It's a very uh, tangible way of saying this is, this is what we're hoping for. This is what we're praying for. And then, according to Leviticus chapter 23, it is celebrated by blowing the shofar. This is a shofar. A shofar is a, a horn of an animal that is used as a trumpet. Later on, I'm going to attempt to blow this. I haven't attempted to blow it since last year, and so I'm not that great at it. Uh, but we will bl blow this later because that is what God asks us to do on this day. <clears throat> and then, um, typically when the shofar is blown in Scripture, it is blown to gather the people together. Now the question becomes, what are we gathering for? And there's a couple of different things. There could be a lot of different things. Usually, the gathering is to A, prepare people for battle, which I'm fine with that if we understand that battle is against darkness. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Okay? Our battle is against darkness, not people. Okay? So let's make sure we're clear with that, because when we start talking about battle imagery, we start getting mean to each other. It's not the, that's not the call. Um, but the other reason, and the, one of the main reasons why people are gathered together with the shofar is because they're going to coordinate a king. They're naming a new king. They're going to celebrate that. So as we take these ideas, and now we begin to see how they're all related, First of all, we say that the shofar it announces a gathering, and it's announcing the gathering of a new king. Uh, now, the reckoning of time, there's a couple ways to do that. You and I, we use a calendar. I've got my calendar sitting right there, and so that I know that it is uh, September, I can look what day it is, and that's how we reckon time, by a calendar. It's on a yearly cycle. Well, at that time, they did that by their crops. We know in the spring we grow this, in the fall we grow this. In the wintertime, we, don't, we plant. In the summer, so they, the crops, they knew that there was a yearly cycle. But there was a different way to tell time, too. If you look in the scripture, it says, uh, in the seventh year of king so-and-so. So it was, time was also reckoned by who was ruling. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen in January. This king comes to rule. He might come to rule in September. And so September might be the start of a new year because of the king. And so you have a, a crop or an a, a agricultural year, which is also the spiritual or celebratory year. And then you have a civil year defined by the king. That's why in these days that God tells us to celebrate, two of them are considered New Year's days, Passover and Rosh Hashanah. I'm throwing a lot at you. I, I recognize that. So if, if you got questions, kind of like, uh, like just raise your hand. Not that I'll take it right now, but I'll know that there's questions that I maybe I need to touch on afterwards. Okay? All right. Was that a nose scratch or a hand raise? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, So when a new king comes into power, then things change, right? A new king comes into power, then now there's different rules. Now you're going to focus on different things. Now new things take priority. And so 
Uh, all of these things are encompassed in this idea of Rosh Hashanah. A new king comes in, it's a, it's a new rule, a uh, new focus. Now, biblically, this all begins at creation. Uh, now, we will never overemphasize the idea of creation in the way, in the picture, and the, and the poetry that creation creates throughout the entire Bible. So a brief look at this will show that there is a king at creation who creates his kingdom. He creates a kingdom, and he does this at the beginning, the Rosh, at the beginning, the very first word of the Bible is Be Rosh, eat, at the beginning. So in the beginning, this is a new year, this king creates a kingdom. He creates inhabitants for this kingdom. People that he's going to work alongside with. They're going to work with him to rule and reign in this kingdom. But his idea of ruling and reigning is better understood as caring and nurturing. That's how we're going to take care of the kingdom. We're going to care for it. We're going to nurture it. The problem is the inhabitants, they changed something out of this original design. They fell away. They said, thanks, but no thanks. They walked away from this king. They said, we don't want to follow these rules. We don't want to do it this way. Now, this creates a need that they return to the king. Okay? And if you're going this way and you have a need now to return and come back to the king, what is that word for returning and going back? Repent. That's right. Repent. Repent literally means change your direction. If you're walking away from God and you're going to repent, you're going to change. You're going to change what you're doing. You're going to change the way you're living. and You're going to change the way you're talking, the way you're thinking, the way you're acting. And then you're going to go back to the king. And so since they fell away, then they were in need now of this change. To bring them back under the proper rule of the king. Now, this gives us some background. But the question comes, what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, if it's not obvious yet, let's talk through that. First of all, trumpets is the fifth holy day. It's the fifth time that's listed in the book of Leviticus that God says, I want to spend this time with you. I want to, to show you something about who I am and what I'm doing through these times. The first four... <clears throat> First one is Passover. On Passover, Jesus was crucified on that day. Okay. The second one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On that day, Jesus was put into the tomb and buried. The next one is First Fruits. On the day of First Fruits, Jesus resurrected from the grave, became the first fruits from the ground. Fifty days later was Pentecost. On Pentecost, a day when there is an ingathering of the, the harvest, the people were brought in and the Holy Spirit was given. Understanding that these days were given by God thousands of years before Jesus. So they're pointing to the life of Jesus. Now those four things have already happened. So the question is, what does trumpets mean in relation to Jesus? Well, let's look at a few passages of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about a time that would include the end times. <clears throat> and he says this, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they will gather together the people, right? Trumpets gathers the people. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Jesus himself is uh, talking about at the end of time when the people are gathered together, it will be initiated by the trumpet. And then in Thessalonians, Paul talks about this. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. The king will arrive. The new king will come. And from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Again, the Lord descends. There's, the, there's this a new era beginning, a, a, a new age that's starting, a new year that's being celebrated, a new king taking the throne. 1 Corinthians, Paul, again, he says, Behold, I will tell you a mystery that we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We will all be changed. There will be something about us that is different. And in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet, the last one, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Notice the tying together of the trumpet and something about change, something different. And it's different because there's a new king. We will be raised from the dead. Because you see, this new king, his rules for his kingdom, he's like, yeah, we're not going to have that anymore. We're not going to do the death thing anymore. We're going to remove that from my kingdom. It's not in my kingdom. So the power of death is going to be removed. And everything will be in alignment with the king. And we, being in alignment with the king, will defy death. And then in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, 11.15, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, the seventh angel, the last angel, sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. This is the idea that there is a new king that is coming, and at this time, when he comes up, sets up his kingdom, all the rules change, everything is different. This is a new era, a new year, and we're called to celebrate that. To celebrate that. And it's going to be announced by a trumpet. This change that is so important, this change that is, that is announced by a trumpet, that is propelled by a new king, that, that gathers all of us together, this change is this concept, this idea of going home. You see, initially we wandered away from God in the garden. The change that He wants from us is to come home to Him. To come back to that setting where we walk with God. Where we partner with God. Where we are on the same mission, the same mindset, the same heart as God. That's the change. We're not, we're not going to something completely different. We're going back to the garden. Back to harmony with our Creator. Back to how it is that we were originally designed. To a place where we care and nurture for all of creation, people and things. It's about coming full circle. We started in the garden. And we're going to come full circle back to that garden place with our King and with our God. But not yet. We're not there yet. But that's why God says, I want you to do this every year. I want you to remember what you're doing. I want you to remember why you're doing this. I want you to remember what your goal is. And, and that, pa last, this, that last passage in Revelation, and the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, and His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. That's going to be here. That's what Jesus prayed, on earth as it is in heaven. So that change that will not be complete until He returns we're supposed to be working towards that now. We're supposed to be doing that now. We're supposed to be having His heart now and His mind now and loving and caring and taking care of one another now. 
Now, we still got to deal with the chaos of this world. We still got to deal with death. We still have to deal with sickness. We still have to deal with the darkness. We still have to deal with all of this stuff. But when God returns, he'll remove those things. But that doesn't mean we don't work for it now. So before we blow the trumpet, last week we saw how God was not interested in us celebrating a holy day just because. He doesn't want us to be ritualistic just to follow the rules. He wants us to have his heart for his people, for his mission. The question becomes the same question that Jesus asked the man who was sitting by the pool for 38 years. Do you want... To change. That's a tough question. Because if you just rattle off yes, then you got to think, if, do you want to change? When Jesus asked that man at that pool, that means if you change, if I heal you, you don't come back here tomorrow. I mean, you do come back here you know, next week <laughs> to church. But that guy is not supposed to go back to the healing pool. The question is, if you change, what gets taken out of your life? You don't go back to that same bar if you're going to change. You, you don't go back to that same website if you're going to change. You don't go back to that drink if you're going to change. You don't go back to those drugs if you're going to change. You don't go back to that thing that you are putting in the place that God is supposed to have in your life. If you say you want to change, you don't go back to the hatred that you spew if you want to change. You don't go back to Facebook and start typing all that nasty stuff about people if you want to change. So do you want to change? Are you ready for change? Are you ready for a new year? Are you ready for our king? Are you ready for him to return? Are you ready for him to set up the kingdom? And newsflash, your political party is not going to set up the kingdom. Your favorite political candidate is not going to set up the kingdom. It is Jesus who's going to set up the kingdom. He's the one. He's the king. He's the one who will bring the kingdom. Are you ready to go back to the original design? Because his words echo today. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Follow me. Now I will blow the trumpet not out of talent but out of obedience. And it's not a ritual. It's a recognition that we are waiting on Jesus. And I apologize ahead of time. take just five minutes, not a real long time, but was there anything, any questions about that?
Yeah, if you didn't hear Kyle, basically there's an argument that says that once Jesus comes along, then these things are no longer necessary. Uh, we don't have to celebrate them. And I would agree 100%. We don't have to. Okay, We're the, This is not a do this or burn situation. Okay, um, This is very much about, uh, again, our hearts and wanting to draw close to God and wanting to know God. We want to, to know who he is and what he does. And again, we just touched just the tip of the iceberg for one of those seven days. Each one of them is so full of imagery and, and truth and, and direction and everything else. And so, yeah, uh, there is a big issue today of people who want to argue about whether you have to or you don't have to. And um, I don't want to ever have to. Okay? I, I get to. I, I, I love, I feel like I learned so much about God every time I have the opportunity to, to dig into these things. Amen. Yeah. And Romans, the book of Romans, uh, the overarching issue of Romans is how do you take a group of Jews and a group of Gentiles and get them to worship together? And so these questions of what do I have to do and what do I not have to do were constantly rising up. So the, the passage he was quoting was out of Romans. So that becomes part of the issue. Uh, much more in-depth teaching that, that we should be prioritizing people over days uh, because that's what Jesus does. He says the most important thing is to love your neighbor. He does not say the most important thing is to keep Sabbath. Does that mean we shouldn't keep Sabbath? No. But he's saying the most important thing is to prioritize people. Anything else I can bring clarity to? What year is that? 5784. 5784? Yeah, if you're asking what is the Jewish year, their year is 5784. All right. If you have, have any questions, uh, let me know. Um, I could literally, I love talking about this stuff. Not that I know all the answers, but I'll sit and talk about it all day long. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Uh, as we celebrate these fall feasts, Lord, we want to um, draw close to you. We want to see, Lord, what it is that you're revealing. Uh, we want to see you and your heart and the invitation that you've extended to us through these things. And so, as we acknowledge them, celebrate them, Lord, I pray that you would draw us closer, that you would give us uh, more truth as to how we should walk through this world, that you would reveal who you are so that we know who it is that we're supposed to be imaging to the world around us. Father, we ask your healing upon us, and then we ask that we be a conduit of that healing to others. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for, for everything, Lord, everything that you give us. Whether we are living in abundance or whether we are living in want, we thank you that you have either provided for us or you are giving us an opportunity to trust you. We thank you. We lift all this up in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.